Hello, good afternoon. So uh, it's with no shortage of regret that I uh, record the final session within uh, CMPT 898 and specifically the final lecture. Uh, this lecture is uh, quite different um, from everything since uh, the very first. Uh, it's um, one that I, I just wanted to take a bit of time to uh, offer some reflections uh, on where we've come, uh, speak a little bit about um, stepping back from sort of the welter of all the, the details, the categorical constructions, uh, the uh, successive concepts built atop one another, uh, to, to reflect on um, where category theory fits in within the broader milieu um, and charter of uh, the work that goes on within CEPHAL, within our computational epidemiology and public health informatics lab, where it fits in our commitment to system science for advancing health and community safety and well-being, human flourishing more, more, broad, more broadly, um, but also uh, talk where it fits in uh, in terms of our commitments to software engineering in support of that vision, uh, software engineering that is at once transparent, modular, easily extensible, flexible, general, et cetera. Uh, I think stepping back and reflecting on this will help provide us an opportunity to, to uh, have a sense of specific areas where category theory can help us along in this journey, this journey to betterment of the human condition uh, through rigorous applications of system science, computational science, applied mathematics and uh, tools from, from data science. So um, we'll turn now to uh, some slides that I hope will explicate this a uh, little bit further. So uh, within this course, we've uh, actually gone through a, a quite, um, a quite large and, and notable set of diverse topics. Um, and I've tried to, at a ver the most crude level, sort of diagram them out here and, and show some major and minor dependencies amongst them. Um, uh, we've reached at some level, all those topics shown uh, in lime green here, um, topics which are shown here uh, in uh, magenta are, are ones that we hit in our discussion group but we didn't have a chance to really explore in the context of, uh, of the course itself. Uh, and then there are some topics to which I had aspired, but um, uh, fell outside uh, the time constraints of, of the course with great, um, with great chagrin. Uh, over the course of, of the semester, um, making our way through these materials, there's been no shortage of of details for us to, to appreciate. Um, uh, a wide variety of different universal constructions and categorical concepts, and they're interlinking with one another. But there's a number of key themes um, that are writ large uh, through this material, through these concepts. The, the unifying theme of, of structure and uh, the primacy of relationships. Uh, the fact that we distinguish things uh, in, in category theory by the roles they play and, and the, um, their relationships to other things rather than uh, enumerating their, their elements, which can go by many different names. Um, we uh, place a, a um, prime emphasis, a foremost role on compositionality, um, reasoning not only about relationship between two things at isolation, but how it relates to other relationships and being able to compose them to say something more about relationships between many things and indeed for the whole. Um, and we've talked much about functoriality of, of mappings that preserve structure, uh, mapping not only objects to objects, 
but morphisms, these relationships to other morphisms uh, in a way that honors compositionality and almost, uh, honors uh, the identity. The structure preserving mappings um, were seen at, at many different levels um, in the context of, of functors themselves, in the context and uh, in, in how functors preserve the structure of categories, uh, natural transformation preserving the structure um, of, these, uh, of these functors, et cetera. But these structure preserving mappings um, um, really uh, get emphasized as well when we go meta and we, uh, we examine um, categories of, of categories or categories of monoids or, or categories of monads, et cetera. Um, and uh, the, map, the morphism in, in said categories are structure preserving mappings of these quantities, such as mappings between monoids being homomorphisms, monoid homomorphisms. They're well-behaved, they're, they're nice, they're elegant, they're subject to composition in, a, in an unambiguous way, or way that the essentials are unambiguous. Much of category theory also, including both parts we, to which we did attend, um, and, and those parts uh, that lay outside what we could cover, uh, particularly these issues of algebras and co-algebras, much of it deals with this relationship of the whole to the parts. Um, uh, we saw elements of this uh, within David Jazz Meyer's coverage in the Topos um, uh, polynomial functors course most recently, uh, but other elements um, seep into uh, to other spheres within category theory, universal constructions. Um, when we're dealing with anamorphisms and, uh, and catamorphisms, um, these relationships between the holes and the parts um, uh, form um, a fruitful and worthy basis for reasoning in category theory, such as, as evidenced by uh, Ellie Adams' PhD thesis at, at MIT, examining the the emergence, uh, the phenomenon of emergence um, coming from how the behavior of the whole differs and is not merely reducible to behaviors of those parts. Um, uh, we, we've seen this kind of unifying notion of understanding objects from, from context uh, that are, um, that is illustrated very powerfully in the context of, you, of the Unita lemma, for example, these notions of generalized elements introduced very early on by Brendan Fong in the MIT IAP um, Programming with Categories course. And we've seen um, a central role in category theory, just as in software engineering and modeling of abstractions, the presence of universal properties, which capture kind of the essence or the exemplars of a, of a pattern. Um, uh, shapes, uh, as it were, and, and representations. And uh, uh, very much at a merely hinting level, we've related this to kind of index categories into another, mapped into another category via functors. Uh, going from the pieces to the whole is a worthy activity here as it is in system science. And the role of synthesis is as much important as important as the role of analysis. Um, and you know, another theme that comes through is, is looking beyond the names for things, recognizing that a rose by any other name is just as sweet. And too many arguments in the world, uh, Feynman once commented over 90%, are merely about labels for things. Um, we, we look to a broader notion of two things being equal to whether they're equivalent in some sense. Uh, with, with isomorphism or natural isomorphism, depending on the context, for example, as, as uh, criteria for judging whether they're essentially the same for all intents and purposes. Tomato, tomato, potato, potato, um, uh, whether we're talking about the same, same things. Um, now, so many of these areas, as I, to which I've given a nod, um, also 
uh, of these themes come up in system science, relationship structures, abstractions, understanding objects from context, relationships of whole to parts, um, the origin of emergence, um, the, the perspective of, of role on roles within, within systems is more defining than, than elements um, of actions um, that, that drive system evolution as being of foremost interest, not merely the nouns, not merely the, the things at any one time with which we are dealing. Uh, and in, in system science, um, there's tremendous opportunities undertapped opportunities for capturing common substructure of systems, recognizing the fundamental similarities between different concepts or different contexts, but also different, um, different systems. Uh, and, and there's a potential truly really addressing that with, with category theory that motivates some of this course. But also uh, category theory serves as this incredibly valuable motivation for general, transparent, um, solid, flexible inspiration for ways of describing, characterizing the dynamics and structure of complex systems, um, especially multi-level or, or laterally composed systems where we might have you know, animal, uh, wild animals and domestic animals and, and, and human health issues in the community and human health issues in the context of, um, of, of formal care systems, hospitals, long-term care, uh, et cetera. Uh, now, these last two points uh, bear noting um, for, for our mission, the mission of Computational Epidemiology, Public Health Informatics Lab, so much of the motivation for category theory lies in this ability to, to strengthen our ways of, of describing, reasoning about, visualizing, uh, communicating uh, insights from and, and helping to critique models uh, associated with complex systems, but also because of its ability to, to allow us to characterize those models more crisply and therefore transform them, optimize them, scale them out across uh, uh, parallel processors, multi-cores or distributed computing resources. Um, and you know, the way I think about it, category theory allows us to characterize structure within domains. I mean, this is, is so basic, perhaps it doesn't need even be said, but because it isn't said much, uh, perhaps enough, um, um, I did want to emphasize it here at the close of our course. Um, fundamentally, what we're working on here is, is, is building up tools for describing systems in ways that lend insight uh, into those systems. Um, and they can describe with admirable generality and in flexibility um, and with great resulting insight structure within different domains of interest. Structure underlying domains in the world, such as we see with, with uh, health systems in the context of One Health, in the context of healthcare delivery, et cetera, and all their, their articulations, but also structure and software abstractions that we use to, to build those tools that are so key for advancing our insights. You know, structures captured and, and modeling within the, the cephal sphere would be, you know, lateral flow between different areas. And I mentioned this example uh, earlier, but there's, there's quite a few others with, uh, uh, with systems of, of disparate sorts that are linked together um, in some sort of lateral way with one flowing into the other or influencing neighboring systems. Uh, including in the context of geographic um, differences or differences uh, in terms of uh, level, um, in terms of uh, sort of different uh, dimensions of the world. Um, we have interactions of different conditions and syndemics. And when it comes to equity issues, these are particularly key. Syndemics between conditions um, 
for example, 1918 flu pandemic, there's an important line of reasoning that that uh, much of the uh, horrific mortality from that may have actually been because of an interaction with uh, tuberculosis. Um, we have interactions between uh, STIs, for example, um, chlamydia, uh, gonorrhea. Uh, we have interactions between chronic uh, immune weakening diseases like, uh, like diabetes and chronic kidney disease and infectious diseases like TB. Uh, between cancers and, and uh, these chronic diseases, such as chronic uh, kidney disease, uh, and uh, between you know, multiple variants of concern for COVID or, or flu and, and COVID, for example. Uh, and this has led to this uh, whole phenomenon, uh, lent to name now by uh, Merrill Singer and, and colleagues uh, of, of syndemics. Uh, and within the sphere of syndemics, not only do we have interaction between uh, health conditions, we have interaction as well between social conditions and uh, often social injustice, um, you know, in the form of um, poor quality housing, poor ventilation, crowding, uh, leading to a great worsening associated with, uh, uh, with spread of infectious disease. Uh, we have issues with lacks of, of access to good nutrition, disadvantaging individuals in terms of immune system strength and inability to fight off infectious diseases, something that um, grievously and in a fashion that arguably came close to genocide um, uh, afflicted our indigenous peoples uh, here in Canada and the US um, as they were forcibly settled uh, and deprived of traditional sources of of food. We have issues uh, associated with uh, injustices in terms of lack of access to sanitation and so on. Think homeless uh, individuals in the spread of infectious disease uh, amongst them, for example. Um, between substance use, uh, uh, violence, uh, HIV, AIDS, um, and addictions, for example, a syndemic described by uh, Singer and Talk and others in their book, uh, Sin, in his book, Syndemics. So these interactions between different conditions are things we need to recognize. And, and, and they're not uh, amorphous in, in structure. They're not inchoate. There's structure to each. And how they articulate has structure. And we need languages, ways of describing and reasoning about these interactions. When we have progression of conditions, um, sudden occurrence of, of infection where it wasn't present before, and then going through natural, possible natural histories of infection, possibly to a stage with complications or metastases. Um, these lead to um, different, different progressions that can be, that, that observe um, and, and proceed according to regularities, to orderliness, to structure. Um, and the sorts of structures we have in category theory can be used to, good, to great effect to describe these. Um, there's multi-scale interactions uh, uh, with cancer, mutations at the level of DNA can ripple up to affect health um, at the topmost levels that lead, lead to broad patterns in society and patterns of care seeking um, that can, um, that can uh, require a strong response from our, our care systems. Um, in cases like the Tasmanian devil, it can lead to, to infectious diseases combined with cancers. Uh, because of that original mutation, it affects and you know, decimates 80% of the Tasmanian devil population within just decades. Uh, we can also get this at the level of uh, interaction uh, in terms of gene cassettes and mobile elements and uh, integrative conjugative elements in the context of antimicrobial resistance. Uh, when we treat with certain drugs, we select for resistant uh, organisms with respect to those drugs, but also with respect to others because of co-location on, on mobile elements or, or on these ICE elements. And, uh, 
and that can lead to co-selection for other drug, uh, drug resistance for other drugs that can then propagate um, between organisms within that animal. So we have sort of networks of, of genes according to co-location. We have networks in terms of uh, classes of drugs that are, are closely related. Sulfinamides, for example, um, uh, are closely related. Um, Penicillin-related drugs. But then we, we also have uh, in, um, multiple organisms, um, uh, microbes within a given host organism and things can spread between them because of the horizontal gene transfer with these mobile elements or ice elements. Um, and that can, can lead to spread from say, um, E. coli to Klebsiella of certain antimicrobial resistance, uh, which can threaten the life, uh, which can sicken an animal, allow for transmission animal to animal. Uh, and uh, ultimately, um, if this occurs on a, um, in the context of animal husbandry or in the wild, it might lead up to, uh, might lead up to eventually spread to people and spread from the community into the lung, into uh, formal care. So we have these multi-scale interactions that are of, of keen importance in certain areas. The behavior of mosquitoes in terms of blood meal seeking can propagate up to grievous burdens of malaria at a population level um, and interactions with the mosquito population or with West Nile with the bird population. Uh, we can get these um, systems that can initially shift between behavioral modes. I mentioned the occurrence of infection of sort of switching to a new mode of progression of, um, of, of, in terms of natural history of infection. We get some of the things to the occurrence of, of pregnancy or a time of delivery, um, onset of puberty, um, occurrence of immunization, et cetera. Um, These the sort of sudden shifts, which are not so much continuous processes, but, uh, but discontinuous ones. There's structure there as well, a uh, structure that can be characterized with categorical concepts. Um, between discrete and continuous evolution or or um, behavior at a high level or low level interactions, uh, uh, network structures at different levels, five different levels plausibly for AMR, antimicrobial resistance. For all these category theory provides us with this expressive, transparent, crisp, general language that really can allow us to get to the heart of the matter and, and characterizing those structures and critically, their composition, the ways in which they piece together to yield, uh, to yield structure for the whole and yield per David Jazz Myers, David Spivak on whose work David Jazz Myers uh, builds, Sophie Libkin, uh, Evan Patterson and others, uh, we can get behaviors from the pieces leading to behaviors for the whole. So that was in, in, in system science area, uh, spheres of modeling, such as in the many projects pursued by, by CEPHAL, chronic communicable diseases, their interactions, zoonoses, et cetera. But, you know, we have these structures uh, ubiquitous in the context of software applications more generally. Uh, if we're seeking to build databases to describe the world. We've seen in this course, in a brief module, um, categorical databases, uh, the ways in which these databases have structure associated with it, and data migration has structure, uh, the ways in which the instantiations of databases can be viewed as, as functors from a, a database category to set. Uh, there's structure in databases, there's structure in diverse other areas. Compilers exhibit a, a very particular structure, um, well categorized in the famous Dragon Book, originally by um, uh, Aho, Sethi, and Ullman. Operating systems uh, through their various evolutions have explored different aspects of structure, microkernel operating systems uh, versus those in the in the, uh, the area of, of, of Unix, for example, um, 
uh, offer offer different structural um, different architectures associated with them. Uh, spreadsheets, um, agent-based simulation has a certain structure to it, as does system dynamic simulation and sort of whether it's Runga Kata or Euler integration, et cetera. If we're building web applications or multi-tier applications, you know, smartphones together with, uh, on a cross-platform basis, together with, uh, uh, with aspects of um, server-side engineering and endpoints and um, uh, architectures to capture the, the, the data layer. These all have distinct structure. Uh, if we have environmental model, uh, monitoring applications or collaborative data collection systems to allow many to collaborate, say, on plate waste studies is an area to which we have contributed. Um, if we have collaborative document or model editing, uh, drawing, um, there's structures there, uh, autonomous vehicle control, yet other structures. All of these are associated with abstractions of structures that we as software engineers often try to characterize. But all too often, the structures within these systems are captured in ways that are at best implicit. Perhaps they're captured in documentation. But all too often at the, at the micro level, that structure, the ability to perceive that structure, reason about it rigorously, soundly, is impaired because it's, it's entangled with a welter of, of, of implementation details. Uh, and we lose the, for the ability to see the forest for the trees. That has unfortunate implications for our ability to engineer that software, to communicate about that software to stakeholders, just as a central need in modeling is to communicate to stakeholders and that's lost if, if all we have is a bunch of Java fourth code um, to describe our model or net logo code. Uh, our ability to, to communicate aspects um, in agile software engineering to our stakeholders is impaired. Ability to secure critiques, um, which are valuable in software engineering, just as they are in modeling, essential to advancement of the scientific process. Category theory has much to contribute here. It provides, once again, as in the system science sphere, this crisp, expressive language that allows us to get to the heart of the matter and characterizing structures and their composition. And what software engineering is not in the business of composing, of taking one element and feeding it into another and feeding it to yet another. Um, that's something she likely pursues, you know, on, on a routine basis. Uh, whether it's on the, the, the Linux command line or whether it's in the form of chaining together, you know, uh, data engineering pipelines or, or chaining together uh, elements of distributed systems or, or different tiers of an end tier system. Category theory provides us this way to get to the heart of the matter, characterizing. Now, um, that has diverse uh, impacts. Uh, it has diverse impacts on modularity, whether we're in system science or, or, or uh, software engineering, on our ability to, to describe this system in ways of having components that can be swapped in or swapped out or replaced or, or um, um, refined without us messing up uh, the whole. Uh, to be able to, to divide and conquer, divide the work up between many parties or, or put together many existing models. Uh, we secure this uh, underappreciated virtue of transparency and visualizability that among the creators of these systems, whether it's software engineers or modelers, reduces chance of mistake, helps ensure uh, that they're reasoning is held current. They can see the forest for the trees, so they have a sense of, of, of where they're at and where they need to go. Uh, but for stakeholders um, in agile modeling processes or agile software engineering, it's essential to get their feedback. 
to help cor them correct us for our cherished prejudices, uh, which are misplaced, or for our cases where we believe that um, this is the case and, and they correct us um, in our understanding. So good stakeholders are four. That's why it takes a village to build a good model and it takes a great team to build good software off it. But there's more advice. Uh, the recognition of this structure allows us to, to transform it um, soundly, rigorously, without risk that will will change its meaning. And by transforming, we can often optimize. And, and that optimization can allow us to save enormous benefit. We saw that in discussing natural transformations, didn't we? Uh, with natural transformations, for example, we saw a natural transformation between list functor uh, and maybe functor, for example, guarantees the equivalent that if we are going to map a function, some function f, maybe it's is even, over a list of ints um, to get a list of bools. And then take the, the head of that, that is guaranteed to be the same as just taking the head of the original list and then mapping that function in, in the maybe context, just applying it to just the first element, they're guaranteed to be the same. And that can allow us to, to save ourselves a heck of a lot of work in mapping over a list. And instead, to just extract the first element and map that. Um, so this transformability, it sounds abstract and kind of curious, but maybe like there's no obvious benefit. There's profound benefit in, in terms of allowing, cluing us into cases where we can enormously reduce, reduce the amount of work that's required. Composability of these systems um, is key to allow us to, to take two systems described in isolation and, and compose them together. Uh, there's elegance and naturality that's pleasing to the mind and soothing to the soul, as it were. Uh, and there's the real, real potential that describing these systems at a higher level, there's profound potential by abstracting away from the weeds of the forest floor, from the trees themselves to, to see the forest, by capturing the essence of the matter in a crisp way. We understand the dependencies of this system we understand its, its meaning at a deeper level than if it's just some welter of C function calls that are kind of opaque, all full of twisty passages, all looking alike, as it were. Um, when we have a C code base like that, automatically off, uh, detecting the opportunities for parallelism, recognizing the parallel structure is fraught with error. So we don't know what's going on in those function calls, what weird casts are performed of something to void star um, and passing willy-nilly in a way that violates our sense of what's possible with the type. Um, if we describe the heart of the matter, we can reason for opportunities of, of paralyzing software, scaling it out in a distributed computing fashion. Um, so there's enormous benefits here for recognizing the structure, crisply characterizing it. And, and I, I mentioned those final two, but there's many other benefits for system science. Um, you know, they can clue us in, as, as the Topos Institute talk uh, recently spoke about, or, 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 or event recently spoke about finding the right abstraction. Identifying the right abstractions uh, is, is a key need in system science, you know, and, and, and software engineering as well. Um, uh, and category theory can help us with that. They can provide us the inspiration um, for identifying expressive APIs, um, frameworks for describing complex systems that can allow us to build 
far more general tools than are far more, more, more uh, appropriate and natural tools that are currently available. Tools that whose, whose current crudeness often makes me embarrassed. Uh, we can compose uh, together uh, these models that we have in ways that, that form much larger models um, while guaranteeing appropriate passing off of results, for example, and it's secrecy and capturing bidirectional dependencies that may be involved. It can allow us to more rigorously reason about this key issue in system science of how behavior of the whole emerges from that of the parts. Um, it can also allow us to understand how structure at one level gives rise to structure at another, or behavior at one to behavior at another, a key one, right? Where we see different behaviors at the individual level, at the family level, the neighborhood level, at the level of broader city or, or region. In epidemiology, for example, reasoning about how it propagates up can be key because often we can motivate behaviors at a low level with policies at a high level, um, but knowing those relationships um, requires, requires insight, understanding what's driving the big patterns at the overall level and how it can relate to patterns of behaviors we might nudge is often key in many spheres, including risk behaviors for chronic diseases, uh, not least. It provides us this way of, of modeling more effectively, picking the right relationships to, to characterize or the most salient relationships, um, defining our, our model terms uh, in the ways we most fit to the, uh, to the situation. What 99.9% .9 to leave out and what 0.01% to actually characterize, as it were. Provides us this way of capturing um, diverse types of relationships and structure and understanding uh, where emergence uh, uh, originates. Uh, it can allow us as well to recognize certain natural invariants in systems, certain conservation properties uh, in complex systems that constrain the dimensionality of those systems, uh, that constrain their behaviors in ways that may not be obvious, and in ways that, of which we can take advantage. Uh, we may be able to exploit these natural invariants to good effect, um, and we don't have to worry about enforcing them because nature does so. Uh, we can also make use of, in a system science area, this ability to, to categorify areas and, and pop up to higher levels of reasoning in ways that might enrich our epidemiological insights or insights from modeling systems. Um, this ability to describe structure preserving mappings uh, is key and could hold, you know, uh, enormous potential for simplifying our modeling uh, when, we, when we have a need to elaborate it in one way or the other, when we need to add outputs to our systems to not pollute the core logic of our models with mechanisms that are focused on producing epiphenomenal observations from those models or pollute uh, our models with implementation details on that are best captured at another level. It may allow us to keep common, common code bases and simply map them via structure preserving mappings for different needs, such as adding calibration mechanisms or particle filtering mechanisms, such as to be able to visualize, et cetera. Maybe allow us to run a model with all sorts of added instrumentation to visualize it to reason about it, to record key elements, to analyze driving feedbacks within the system. 
in order to, to identify error conditions and, and uh, confirm sanity of behavior using certain assertions um, while running with the same underlying model. Structure preserving mappings, potential for adjunctions, uh, and in this capacity to, to capture in a separation of concerns fashion, uh, different needs. And finally, and not to be minimized, of absolutely central importance of system science. I noted earlier, is this transparency for stakeholders. This ability for stakeholders to critique our structure is central to the scientific process because we're dealing with domains where they are the experts about the structure of these domains, not us. Whether it's clinicians, those understanding the, the, the generative pathways at a, at a biochemical level, whether it's individuals who understand uh, the health system structure, um, the flows to um, what governs flows to uh, ICUs, what leads a person to stay in the wards, what prevents discharge from wards to the community uh, for, for patients with mental health distress or associated with patients with, uh, who need, uh, or complex patients uh, who are fragile elderly and need extra levels of care um, from home care, long-term care, et cetera. Um, we inevitably in system science, when we're applying models of richness with the world, we need to turn to domain experts who understand that structure. And category theorists, just like systems modelers, recognize that a model is so much more than the data that goes into it, because it's the structure as much as any sort of data, and probably more so. It's the structure that makes the difference. And by representing that structure in a transparent fashion, in a fashion that can be illustrated with wiring diagrams, stock and flow diagrams, state charts, et cetera. By categorifying it, we can use those as the base representations. Those are not merely side representations that grow stale and obsolete over time as the code base evolves, as some welter of inter entangled code evolves but rather those are the, the core representations and stakeholder feedback to them can help zero in where our assumptions are off base, zero in on, on omissions, on cases where we need to break out certain concepts. If we just have infected people and we need to break it out to oligosymptomatic versus symptomatic, for example, or previously infected, reinfected people versus those who are infected for the first time. Stakeholders clue us into that. They also, and, and that cluing us in is part of the scientific advancement that's central to the success of our models. If we can't secure that feedback, we have short changed the scientific opportunities for our modeling. Uh, similarly, they have to give feedback on outputs from the model. This is probably less affected uh, sent quite essentially by system by uh, categorification. But there too, there's enormous opportunities. If we could allow different stakeholders to run a model with different interfaces, clue key to, to their interests. The demographer looks at age categories and, and, and summaries across the age categories. The clinician looks at the the patient flows and compares it to their experiences. The, the public health officer looks at, uh, at broad outcomes in terms of overall burden, but some of the, uh, the outcomes stratified by, um, um, by char characteristics of heterogeneity, dimensions of heterogeneity, in particular, with particular attention to uh, vulnerable groups. Um, and they're providing feedback on the plausibility of these results for some baseline. Um, that can allow us to zero in on, on gaps in the model. Whereas if we just have one size fits all interface for everyone, um, that's harder to do. And it's that ability to allow for different lenses for different individuals that can provide, uh, that category theory can help, help enhance by providing a common model that can be targeted 
mapped to outputs uh, for different stakeholders or instrumented with different types of outputs. I noted um, the central role, this is a bit out of place of, of you know, central to the notion of system science is this relationship between the whole and the parts. And, and uh, as I noted, in some areas to which we did attend, optics, categorification, and universal constructions, we've seen some elements of that. But uh, catamorphisms and anamorphisms in the algebra co-algebra area are particularly rich um, in this sphere as well. In the, in the sphere of software engineering, um, some issues that I've talked about, many and that I've alluded to certainly um, fall into this sphere. After all, we are artifacts. So we build a system scientists are typically software artifacts. And, so I gave reference to the importance of optimizing them, et cetera. Um, but um, you know, for, for software engineering, understanding the, uh, the structure of systems is central. Um, higher level functional programming offers us this incredible toolbox and category theory is, is central to the motivation for that toolbox. Um, such as the many contributions of Edward Komet, um, but also the um, uh, amazing contributions of, of Phil Wadler and, and his vision. Uh, category theory allows us to formalize patterns uh, that we see in, in, in functional and programming paradigms, these patterns that have built up uh, as idioms over decades of use can be formalized in category theory. And monads, for example, as Jerry Sussman is, has commented, um, uh, formalizing patterns that are dated back perhaps to the 60s uh, among uh, talented LISP programmers, such as within the MIT community. Um, you know, within software engineering, uh, this ability to kind of burrow down to describe the essentials of structures um, in a crisp way, allows more general toolboxes uh, to be built up uh, by stripping away in essentials and allowing us to have these readily reusable components that depend only on something being a, a functor or another thing being a, a natural transformation, which can be applied to huge number of different areas, different spheres. Um, Within the software engineering sphere, um, it bears noting that we're, as in modeling, we're often characterizing real world structures. Maybe it's not the evolution of behavior in those real world structures, uh, but it's, it's real world structures that, that we are describing. Maybe it's a, um, um, you know, registrar's uh, system for for student registrations at an educational institution or a database of associated with health insurance claims or, or uh, you know, a system uh, that is used to collect um, electronic health records or what have you. Um, there's, uh, there's real world phenomena and structures being captured there at some abstract level and Category theory provides this way of, of characterizing uh, these structures in, in a functional fashion, in a way that, that is high level, general, flexible, modular, and, and amenable to transformation in equational reason. We can reason uh, on account of this high level characterization with greater clarity about uh, the programming challenges we face. And, and work to optimize based on that. Um, and um, whether it's high level computer aided software engineering case type systems um, or, or characterizing systems uh, a little bit more formally when our code makes use of these high level abstractions, it, um, it will often, um, do so in a way that's more re readily retargetable. 
uh, and we can take advantage of that structure then in implementation. If we reify it, if we recognize the logic of a natural transformation, we can use that sort of transformation we talked about earlier for optimization. And we can often, again, use it as opportunities for parallelization and, and transformation. And I list you know, a set of different concepts there that can carry over into software engineering analogs. And I note once again, as for system science, for software engineering, the key benefits here for modularity, transparency of visualizability, transformability, composability uh, of these software systems, analytic reasoning, the elegance and naturality of these systems and this ability for, for optimization. So those are some reflections uh, on once we've come and whither we go. Um, the, the motivations for it, and just a pop-up reminder of why this is so central to the Charter of Cephal. There are some topics that I keenly regret not being able to include in this course. Um, perhaps foremost amongst them are algebras and co-algebras. That is not a topic we talked about in our discussion group and it is both fascinating, practical, useful, and uh, important uh, for, for our work. Uh, and it, it really does nicely illustrate this ability to go from the, the pieces to the whole. Gets into important areas such as fixed points. Um, uh, and it also dovetails nicely with category uh, categorification. Um, you know, I am lent solace in our coverage by the fact that quite a few key topics, topics that I think I do a disservice to you to not cover, are ones that we've uh, previously covered within our discussion group, not 14 months thence. Uh, adjunctions, Galois connections as examples of adjunctions and pre-orders, monads, and monad algebras. Um, these are topics that I feel we, we gave at least um, a decent uh, nod to within that discussion group. And I would invite you to review some of the lectures and, uh, to that. I, I believe that um, I've offered a, at least some modicum of, of justice to them. But um, I, I feel nearly a sense of shame for having not talked about limits and co-limits, for example. Um, uh, so important when it comes to universal constructions more broadly, although we have seen examples of them with co-products and co-products, for example. Um, Lavier theories are uh, very, very interesting constructs that are also very important for capturing computational effects. They also are kind of a beautiful synthesis of, of many of the concepts we, we built up here um, and of categorical thinking. Um, a tour de force uh, from Bill Lavier in the 1960s, I believe, um, that uh, resonate very much with us today um, and in the area of computational effects, no, no little. They interact very interestingly with monads and so on. And there's tremendous potential, I think, to exploit them further in the software engineering, potentially in the system science sphere. Uh, ends and coens um, related to profunctors and uh, some very interesting uh, work there, um, kind of like infinite products or infinite co-products, but where we kind of collapse certain things down as belonging in equivalence classes. Um, and uh, some neat, neat work relates them to some of the other concepts. And they end up being quite useful, not least in the optics area. Um, Pre-sheaves 
and sheaves are another area that I really, really would have liked to have uh, spoken about. It's extremely interesting. And for seeking to have a consistent model of the world, we can talk about matching families and the concepts of supporting a pre sheaf that is, in fact, a sheaf uh, that has a consistent view of the world. Uh, pre sheaves um, uh, are very useful constructs. Um, uh, mapping mapping uh, into to set, CEOP into set. Uh, and we actually saw them very briefly, um, although I'm not sure I used the name, uh, in the context of representable functors. Uh, they're pretty interesting quantities and ones that are covered in the um, uh, applied category theory course. Uh, based on seven sketches uh, uh, by Brendan Fong and David Spivak in uh, 2019. Um, in closing, we've come a very long way in this course. We've come that way because of your commitment to stick by this and and apply yourselves through thick and thin um, and, and being willing to you know, undergo a bit of discomfort and to uh, push your limits with this. I recognize this, this material is not easy. But as I argued at the beginning of, of the course, it can be argued that we're dealing here uh, with, a, uh, with a situation which is crunchy on the outside, but soft and gooey on the inside. Uh, like one of these Ferrero Rocher candies, right? That uh, you bite into and you can be forgiven for thinking it's hard. Um, but once you crunch through the exterior, you find um, there's lots of chocolatey goodness in there. And I believe it's very similar with lots of chocolatey goodness in the area of category three. And, um, I know it's been hard. Uh, I know it's required um, stretching yourself and, and putting aside your discomfort uh, at times and, willing, and a willingness to say, you know, um, I don't understand this for now, but I have some inkling of what's being talked about. I'll, I'll go forward for now. Maybe I'll, my understanding will improve later. I've lived with that for all my time and I'm so glad that um, that you felt um, you know that you committed yourself to to finishing this course uh, despite that feeling. Um, this grows on you, and over time, as you re-encounter this material further and further, you will come to develop not just better understanding, but good intuitions and even a good visceral visceral sense often. Um, for why this all fits together in a most fantastically beautiful um, medley uh, on which um, you know Vermeer and Bach have have nothing um, and nothing going. Um, uh, this is every bit as, as beautiful as their as their creations. Uh, so you know if you want to have a sense of where we've come, I'd invite you to go back and take a look at some of those videos that you examined at the start of the course. Um, that six to seven minute introduction on what is category theory um, that threw at you all sorts of, of buzzwords of, of categories and functors and natural transformations, et cetera, um, that probably seemed so mysterious when you first encountered it. But hopefully you can see through it now to see the general patterns of relationships and structural preserving mappings, et cetera. Uh, the invitation to applied category theory that David Spivak gave and, and the um, applied category theory conference in 2020 um, um, also was recommended for a, for a different perspective and one that, that harks to this um, uh, these desirable features of, of, of category theory, the, the benefits that it can offer. Uh, Eugenia Chung's um, uh, remarkable uh, contributions in these areas are, are not to be 
uh, uh, done a disservice. Uh, and uh, I would note her category theory in life uh, talk uh, at uh, Lambda World um, uh, from Australia as, uh, as kind of walking through widespread applicability of many category theoretic concepts, a wonderful treatment that's at the same time quite accessible. And then the next year, she offered uh, a quite different treatment in response to questions. People wrote out questions and she worked to answer them and try to answer each, you know, do, do justice to a number of the questions, uh, sometimes by drawing out things and, and, and trying to walk people through um, confusions about certain category theory concepts. Uh, I view Eugenia as one of the sort of leaders in communicating these materials and, and helping to make them accessible and, and uh, offer widespread appreciation uh, for them. Uh, and uh, I would suggest taking a look at her, her two presentations because you'll probably gain from this vantage point so much more for them. Um, this course has been uh, highly imperfect. It's been, uh, you know, um, less than I would I would uh, like to give. And uh, but I I feel that uh, we could have done worse. Uh, and I'm so grateful to you as partners uh, for bearing through this first teachings of this material, rough rough though it was, and um, um, and incomplete in some ways uh, though it is. So uh, thank you so much for your contributions to this course. Uh, thank you for your dedication. Thank you for your excitement. Uh, I look forward to working with you on your projects and to hopefully getting a chance uh, with some or many of you to explore these materials in the potential of category theory to system science, to software engineering, and to the broader mission of CEPHAL in coming months and years. Thank you so much. And uh, I look forward to, uh, uh, to future episodes. Take care there. With that, I will close this course. Thank you.